Interface Configuration. Here we'll look at the topics of Security Zones and Interfaces, Tap Interfaces, Virtual Wire Interfaces, Layer 2 Interfaces, Layer 3 Interfaces, Virtual Routers, VLAN Interfaces, Loopback Interfaces, and Policy-Based Forwarding. This diagram is a simplified version of the flow logic of a packet traveling through a Palo Alto Network's firewall. The course will reference this diagram to address where specific concepts fit into the packet processing sequence. For more information about the packet handling sequence inside of a PanOS device, see the Packet Flow Sequence in PanOS document available on the Palo Alto Network's support website at https colon slash slash live dot palo alto networks dot com slash docs slash doc one six two eight. You can use numerous methods to integrate Palo Alto Network's firewalls into your environment. Many implementations evolve over time, and they transition between some or all of these possible configurations. Three common deployments are illustrated here. Each deployment is described in more detail later in this module. A brief overview of TAP, Virtual Wire, and Layer 2 features follows. TAP. With TAP interfaces, the firewall can be connected to a Core Switches Switch Port Analyzer, or SPAN, or Mirror Port, to identify applications running on the network. This option requires no changes to the existing network design. In this mode, the firewall cannot block any traffic. Virtual Wire with virtual wire interfaces, the firewall can be inserted into an existing topology without requiring any reallocation of network addresses or redesign on the network topology. In this mode, all of the protection and decryption features of the device can be used. NAT functionality is provided in this mode. And Layer 3. With Layer 3 interfaces, the firewall can take the place of any current enterprise firewall deployment. A unique advantage of the firewall is your ability to mix and match these interface types on a single device. For example, the same firewall can be deployed in TAP mode for one portion of the network and be in virtual wire or layer 3 mode for another. Security Zones and Interfaces All firewall models include in-band interfaces that are used to control network traffic flowing across an enterprise. These interfaces are labeled in the web UI using the format Ethernet N slash N. On a single slot firewall, the first N is always 1, and the second N represents the number assigned to the in-band port. On a multi-slot firewall, the first N represents the slot number, and the second N represents the number assigned to the in-band port in that slot. Each firewall interface supports multiple logical interfaces, called sub-interfaces, in the web UI. Sub-interfaces can be used to support VLANs, for example. A physical port or a sub-interface can be assigned to only a single security zone. However, a zone can contain multiple physical or logical interfaces. Palo Alto Network's firewalls use the concept of security zones to secure and manage your networks. Systems with similar security needs are grouped into zones. For example, you would expect to see traffic initiated from the Internet making connections into a DMZ network, but you would not expect to see Internet traffic going into a data center network. To enforce this behavior, the DMZ network can be placed in one zone, and the data center network can be placed in another zone. You can configure different firewall security policy rules to control the traffic to and from each zone. Zones are a logical grouping based on a particular type of traffic on your network. 
The physical location of a zone and its traffic is irrelevant. In fact, a single zone can reside at different locations throughout your enterprise. Zone names have no predefined meaning or security policy associations. You should choose descriptive zone names that help designate specific types of business functions, locations, or access privileges. In the example, the descriptive zone names are DMZ, Internet, Data Center, Users, and Guest. By default, a PAN-OS security policy allows intra-zone traffic, which allows systems in the same zone to freely communicate with each other. However, inter-zone traffic is denied by default. For example, a server in the DMZ zone cannot communicate with a server in the data center zone unless you explicitly create a security policy rule that allows communication. Security policy rules are described in another module. You can use numerous methods to integrate Palo Alto Network's firewalls into your environment. Many implementations evolve and will transition from one configuration to another. To support a wide variety of deployment options, PanOS software includes different zone types and interface types. Each zone type supports specific interface types. The five zone types and the interface types they support are illustrated here. Different zone and interface types can be used simultaneously on different physical firewall interfaces. Notice that a Layer 3 zone supports a number of interface types. All these interface types are assigned IP addresses. Tunnel zones are available starting in PAN OS 8.0. They are used in a feature named Tunnel Content Inspection and specifically for a particular scenario involving tunnel-in-tunnel -tunnel encapsulation. Tunnel zones are not described in this module, and for more information about tunnel zones, refer to the PAN OS 8.0 Administrator's Guide at paloaltonetworks.com slash documentation. HA interfaces are different from the other interface types because they are not used to control normal network traffic. HA interfaces are used for synchronization of a pair of firewalls deployed in a high availability configuration. Because they do not control normal network traffic, they are not placed in a security zone. The MGT interface is used for firewall management and is not assigned to a zone. This module describes the purpose and configuration of the TAP, Virtual Wire, Layer 2 and Layer 3 zone types, and the most common interface types. Other interface types are described in other modules. Because security policy rules use zones to control and log traffic, one of the first tasks to perform is to create your zones by naming the zone and specifying the zone type. If interfaces of the appropriate type have already been configured, you can assign them to the zone. However, you can add interfaces to the zone later. Interfaces not assigned to a zone do not process traffic. Each interface can be assigned only to a single zone. The zone name is case sensitive. For example, capital DMZ and lowercase DMZ would not be the same zone. The five primary zone types are shown in the example. TAP, Virtual Wire, Layer 2, Layer 3, and Tunnel. A sixth zone type named External is a special zone that is available only on some firewall models. The external zone allows traffic to pass between virtual systems when multiple virtual systems are configured on the same firewall. Virtual systems are supported only on the PA2000, 3000, 4000, 5000, and 7000 series firewalls. The external zone type is visible in the pull-down list only when it is supported by a firewall with the virtual systems feature enable.
interface to connect to a switch's span. All can use a tap interface. The firewall can use a tap interface to connect to a switch's span or mirror port. A tap interface passively collects and logs monitored traffic to the firewall's traffic log. Tap mode deployment often is used to initially discover the types of application and user traffic flowing across a network. The information recorded in the traffic log can be used by an administrator to help configure appropriate security policy rules to allow or block traffic. Because traffic is flowing to the firewall but is not flowing through the firewall, a TAP interface cannot be used by a firewall to block traffic or perform traffic shaping. An advantage of using a TAP interface to monitor network traffic flowing through a switch is that it does not require any network address changes. If the span or mirror port passes encrypted traffic, the TAP interface supports only SSL inbound decryption. Decryption, including SSL inbound decryption, is described in another module. Even though a firewall does not block traffic flowing into a TAP interface, the firewall still can thoroughly identify the traffic. You can configure the firewall to perform App ID, Content ID, User ID, and SSL inbound decryption. All of these features are described in other modules. Even though a TAP interface does not relay traffic like the other interface types, you still must assign it to a zone, and the zone must be a TAP type zone. You must assign it to a zone because security policy rules are required to log network traffic, and the security policy rules require zones in order to process network traffic. To enable logging, you must configure a security policy rule with the source and destination zone set to the zone that contains the TAP interface. The Security Zone drop-down list will list only zones of type TAP. The firewall can generate and export NetFlow version 9 records to an outside NetFlow collector. The firewalls support only unidirectional NetFlow, not bidirectional. You can enable NetFlow exports on all interface types listed in this module except HA. The NetFlow feature is available on all firewalls except the PA4000 series models. Virtual Wire Interfaces a virtual wire deployment binds two firewall interfaces together. It also is referred to as a bump in the wire or transparent inline deployment. No MAC or IP address is assigned to either virtual wire interface. A virtual wire configuration typically is used when no switching or routing is required. No configuration changes are required for adjacent network devices, which means that you can insert the firewall into an existing topology without requiring any reallocation of network addresses or redesign on the network topology. A virtual wire configuration is defined in two steps, creating the virtual wire object and configuring the virtual wire interfaces that the object connects. You can accomplish these steps in any order. The virtual wire object provides the data path between the two virtual wire interfaces. Some firewall models come with a pre-configured virtual wire object that connects Ethernet ports 1 and 2. Network traffic flows through a firewall in a virtual wire, which means that the firewall can examine, traffic shape, and block traffic. You can configure the firewall to perform App ID, Content ID, User ID, SSL decryption, NAT, and QoS on the virtual wire. All of these features except QoS are described in other modules. A virtual wire does not support routing or firewall management traffic because no IP address is assigned to a virtual wire interface. A virtual wire also cannot function as a termination point for an IPsec VPN tunnel. You must create a virtual wire object that connects the two virtual wire interfaces. A virtual wire must always connect two interfaces. 
If the virtual wire interfaces have not yet been configured, the interface fields can be left blank until the interfaces exist. Only interfaces configured as virtual wire interfaces appear on the interface drop-down lists. A virtual wire object can block or allow traffic based on 802.1Q VLAN tag values. You can specify tag numbers in the range 0 to 4094. A tag value of 0 represents untagged traffic and will pass untagged traffic that is allowed by a security policy rule. You also can specify VLAN tags or ranges of VLAN tags to allow. For example, 4, 5, 10 through 12, and 20 to 25 is a valid entry in the Tags Allowed field. The virtual wire will pass traffic on these VLANs as long as that traffic is allowed by the security policy rules. To subject all tagged and untagged traffic to security policy rule evaluation, set the Tag Allowed field to the value of 0 to 4094. By default, all multicast traffic is passed through the virtual wire. To alter this behavior and apply security policy rules to multicast traffic, select the Multicast Firewalling checkbox. By default, the link state of the devices on each side of the virtual wire is passed through the firewall because Link State Pass-Through is pre-selected. You must configure the virtual wire interfaces that will be connected by the virtual wire object. Choose an interface and select the interface type Virtual Wire. If the virtual wire object has not been configured, the virtual wire field can be left blank. The interface names can be specified when you create the virtual wire object. A zone is required for each of the virtual wire interfaces because firewall security policy rules are based on zones. Only zones of the type Virtual Wire will be listed on the Security Zone drop-down list. The firewall can generate and export NetFlow version 9 records to an outside NetFlow collector. The firewalls support only unidirectional NetFlow, not bidirectional. You can enable NetFlow exports on all interface types listed in this module except HA. The NetFlow feature is available on all firewalls except the PA4000 series models. You also can create multiple virtual wire sub-interfaces that will read and classify traffic according to an administrator-defined VLAN tag, IP classifier, or both. An IP classifier can be a specific address, a range of addresses, or a subnet address. Assign each sub-interface to a different security zone, which enables you to apply granular policy controls to different traffic flows arriving or leaving through the same physical firewall port. In the example, both tagged and untagged Ethernet frames are allowed on the physical port Ethernet 1-2. However, frames tagged with VLAN ID1 are assigned to the logical interface 1-2.1 and are considered part of the ENG security zone. Untagged frames that are associated with IP network 129.56.7.0-24 are assigned to the logical interface 1-2.2 and are considered part of the HR security zone. You can define security policy rules that control traffic going into or coming out of these zones. Layer 2 Interfaces In a Layer 2 deployment, the firewall provides switching between two or more interfaces. You must assign a group of interfaces to a common VLAN object in order for the firewall to switch between them. The VLAN object connects the interfaces into a single Ethernet broadcast domain. A Layer 2 configuration is defined in two steps, creating the VLAN object and configuring the Layer 2 interfaces that the VLAN object connects. You can accomplish these steps in any order. The VLAN object provides the switched data path between the Layer 2 interfaces.
The firewall is not a participant in the Spanning Tree Protocol, or STP. However, STP packets from external switches are forwarded through the VLAN object to other external switches. Network traffic flows through a firewall between Layer 2 interfaces, which means that the firewall can examine, traffic shape, and block traffic. You can configure the firewall to perform App ID, Content ID, User ID, SSL decryption, and a QoS in a Layer 2 deployment. All of these features, except QoS, are described in other modules. A Layer 2 interface does not support routing or firewall management traffic because no IP addresses are assigned to a Layer 2 interface. You can create Layer 2 sub-interfaces and assign each sub-interface to an 802.1Q VLAN. The firewall performs VLAN tag switching when Layer 2 sub-interfaces are attached to a common VLAN object. Traffic in different VLANs can share a common physical firewall port, but traffic between them is blocked by default. To enable traffic to flow between separate VLANs, for example VLAN 1 and VLAN 2, you would have to configure a router and the appropriate security policy rules. Even though Layer 2 sub-interfaces are available on the firewall, the best practice is to use Layer 3 sub-interfaces with each Layer 3 sub-interface assigned to a VLAN rather than to use VLAN objects and Layer 2 sub-interfaces. Use of Layer 3 sub-interfaces provides isolation at Layer 2, yet provides a routing path between networks at the IP layer. Layer 3 interfaces and sub-interfaces are described later in this module. Now let's move to Layer 3 interfaces. A Layer 3 deployment enables routing traffic between multiple Layer 3 interfaces. You must assign an IP address to each Layer 3 interface. Because each Layer 3 interface consumes at least one IP address, a Layer 3 deployment can require network reconfiguration in your enterprise. Routing between Layer 3 interfaces requires a router. In the example, an internal virtual router provides a routable connection between the Layer 3 interfaces. Network traffic can flow through a firewall between Layer 3 interfaces, which means that the firewall can examine, traffic shape, and block traffic. You can configure the firewall to perform App ID, Content ID, User ID, SSL decryption, NAT, and QoS in a Layer 3 deployment. All of these features except QoS are described in other modules. A Layer 3 interface can support firewall management traffic because it is assigned an IP address. Layer 3 interfaces support both the IPv4 and IPv6 protocols. These protocols can be deployed separately or in a dual stack configuration. However, before the firewall can support any feature that might use IPv6, including Layer 3 interfaces, you must enable IPv6 on the firewall. To configure a Layer 3 interface, browse to Network, Interfaces, Ethernet, and select an interface. The minimum required properties for configuring a Layer 3 interface are the interface type, IP address, and security zone. Select the interface type of Layer 3. If you want to be able to route traffic to and from the interface, you will need to have a router. If a virtual router has been configured on the firewall, select it from the virtual router drop-down list. A virtual router can be added later. All Layer 3 interfaces assigned to a specific virtual router share the same routing table. Then select a security zone from the Security Zone drop-down list. Only zones configured as Layer 3 zones appear on the drop-down list.
You can configure a Layer 3 interface with one or more static IPv4 addresses or as a DHCP client. To configure static IP addresses, select the Static Radio button. You can assign multiple IPv4 addresses to the same interface, although they should not be in the same subnet. To configure an interface using DHCP, click the DHCP Client Radio button. Configure an interface as a DHCP client for situations where the firewall must have a dynamically assigned IP address. Such situations might include automatic deployment of a virtual firewall in a cloud environment. If the DHCP server provides a default route to the interface, you can configure the interface to propagate the default route to the interface's virtual router. You can configure the firewall to be a point-to-point -point protocol over Ethernet, or PPPoE, termination point, to support a connection to a DSL modem. You can configure a Layer 3 interface with one or more IPv6 addresses. To configure the interface with a Link Local address, select the Enable IPv6 on the Interface checkbox. A Link Local address prefix is prepended to an EUI64 interface ID to form the Link Local address. If an IPv6 router is available to the interface, then the interface also could acquire a global address. Click Add to configure the interface with global addresses if these addresses are not required by Stateless Address Auto Configuration, or SLAAC. On the Address Resolution tab, select the Enable Duplication Address Detection checkbox to configure the interface to use IPv6 neighbor solicitation messages to check for a duplicate address. You can use the other fields in the Address Resolution tab to customize how Duplicate Address Detection, or DAD, operates on the interface. You can enable the interface to send IPv6 router advertisements by selecting the Enable Router Advertisement checkbox on the Router Advertisement tab. The web UI includes a number of fields that enable you to customize how router advertisements operate on the interface. The DNS Support tab is available only if router advertisements have been enabled. Use the DNS Support tab to configure the IPv6 DNS server and domain suffix information that the interface should include in the router advertisements. The Advanced tab enables you to configure a variety of Layer 3 interface settings. For example, you can modify each individual interface's link speed and duplex settings, or modify its MTU settings. Modifying the MTU settings here overrides the firewall's default jumbo frame and global MTU values configured in Session Settings at Device, Setup, Session. You also can adjust the TCP MSS to be a specified number of bytes less than the interface's MTU. Use the Management Profile drop-down list to apply an Interface Management Profile to the interface. An Interface Management Profile defines the type of firewall management services that are accessible through the Layer 3 interface. Use the ARP Entries tab to preload ARP table entries in the firewall's ARP cache or use the ND Entries tab to preload IPv6 neighbor discovery entries. If you need an IPv6 NDP proxy, the NDP proxy tab enables you to configure the interface as an NDP proxy that will respond to ND queries. That will respond to ND queries. This tab also enables you to configure the IPv6 addresses for which the NDP proxy will respond. Use the LLDP tab to enable LLDP on the interface and to configure its behavior. The Untagged Subinterface checkbox enables you to create Layer 3 subinterfaces that are not assigned to a specific VLAN but carry untagged traffic. Layer 3 subinterfaces are described later in this module.
By default, the out-of-band MGT port is designed to support firewall management functions and services. Alternatively, you can apply an interface management profile to a Layer 3 interface to enable it to carry management traffic. An interface management profile protects the firewall from unauthorized access by defining the protocols, services, and IP addresses that an in-band firewall interface permits for traffic to the firewall. Because a Layer 3 interface resides in a security zone, you will need to configure appropriate security policy rules to allow the management traffic. For example, you might want to prevent users from accessing the firewall web interface over the Layer 3 interface, but allow that interface to receive ping queries from your network monitoring system. In this case, you would enable ping and disable HTTP slash HTTPS. Ping would enable the firewall to respond to an ICMP echo request, which is useful to verify basic network connectivity to the interface. Response pages enable a firewall to present information to users in response to their activity. For example, a response page might be the presentation of an interactive web page to a user asking them to verify a file transfer before the firewall will allow the file transfer. You can assign an interface management profile to Layer 3 interfaces and sub-interfaces and to logical interfaces such as VLAN, loopback, and tunnel interfaces. If you do not assign an interface management profile to an interface, the firewall denies access to all firewall management services. You can restrict management traffic, enabled by a profile, to one or more specific IP addresses by adding them to the Permitted IP Addresses field. If any permitted IP addresses are configured, then only the IP addresses listed can access the selected functions and services. If the field is left blank, the profile allows any IP address to access the selected functions and services, assuming that it is not blocked by a security policy rule. You can create Layer 3 sub-interfaces and assign each sub-interface to an 802.1Q VLAN. Traffic in different VLANs can share a common physical firewall port, but traffic between them is isolated at Network Layer 2. However, traffic can be routed between the VLANs at Network Layer 3 if a route exists between them at the IP Network Layer. You will still need to configure appropriate security policy rules to allow traffic to flow between different security zones. In the example, the sub-interfaces 1-2.2 and 1-3.2 have been assigned to the same VLAN and the firewall will use Ethernet switching to pass traffic between them. The sub-interfaces 1-2.1 and 1-3.3 are in different VLANs. Traffic could be passed between them only at the IP layer through a virtual router. Because these sub-interfaces also are in different security zones, and interzone traffic is blocked by default, you would also have to configure appropriate security policy rules in order to pass traffic between these sub-interfaces. You also would need a virtual router and appropriate security policy rules to pass traffic between the sub-interfaces in VLANs 1 and 3. You would also need a virtual router and appropriate security policy rules to pass traffic between the VLAN sub-interfaces and the sub-interfaces in VLANs 1 or 3. Because the sub-interfaces in VLAN 2 are both in the same zone, the firewall will automatically pass network traffic between them. To configure a Layer 3 sub-interface, browse to Network, Interface. You can create Layer 3... To configure a Layer 3 sub-interface, browse to Network, Interfaces, Ethernet, and select a Layer 3 interface. Then click Add Sub-Interface. All of the steps to configure Layer 3 interfaces also apply to Layer 3 sub-interfaces. The difference is your ability to assign a VLAN to a sub-interface by entering a VLAN tag number in the tag field. 
Untagged Layer 3 sub-interfaces also can be used when the Untagged Sub-Interface option is enabled on the Advanced tab of the parent Layer 3 interface. Untagged sub-interfaces are used in multi-tenant environments, where traffic from each tenant must leave the firewall without VLAN tags. In this case, all traffic must be configured for source NAT using the IP address of the untagged sub-interface. Virtual Routers the firewall uses a virtual router to obtain routes to other subnets. You can manually define one or more static routes or configure a virtual router to participate in one or more dynamic routing protocols. The dynamic routing protocols supported on the firewall are RIP version 2, OSPF versions 2 and 3, and BGP version 4. For multicast routing, the firewall supports protocol-independent multicast sparse mode, or PIM-SM, and PIM source-specific multicast, or PIM-SSM. PIM version 2 is used for both multicast protocols. IGMP v1, v2, and v3 also are supported on host-facing interfaces. Virtual routers also can be linked so that traffic can be routed between them. To configure a virtual router, browse to Network Virtual Routers. Provide the virtual router with a unique name. Then add one or more Layer 3, Tunnel, or VLAN interfaces to the virtual router. When you add an interface, its connected networks automatically are added to the virtual router's route table and can be used by the virtual router to forward traffic. Administrative distances help the virtual router to determine the best route to use when multiple routes to the same destination are offered by two different routing protocols. To display the installation default values or the acceptable ranges for each value, click the Help icon, the question mark icon, at the top right of the window. To add a static route, browse to Network, Virtual Routers, Static Routes, and click Add. Enter the name for the static route. In the example, the static route is a default route, so the name chosen was Default. The destination address must include the net mask in CIDR notation. An address of 0.0.0.0, .0 is a default route for any destination IP address that does not match another address in the route table. Select the firewall interface that will be used to forward packets that are assigned to the default route. You assign this interface to a security zone and define the security policy rules that allow or block traffic for this zone. Choose the next hop for the route. The next hop can be a specific IP address or another virtual router. If you select Discard, then any traffic that matches the destination address would be discarded by the firewall. This traffic would not appear in the traffic log because it is discarded before a session is created. Select None if there is no text hop for the route. The Admin Distance field enables you to override the Global Administrative Distance value configured on the Routing Settings tab, which was described on the previous page. The Metric field helps the virtual router to determine the best route to use when multiple routes to the same destination are offered by the same routing protocol. In this example, the metric value would help the router determine the best route between the two static default routes, if there were two static default routes. You can select which route table to install the route into. You can install the entry in the unicast or multicast routing table, or both. Selection of No Install would stage the route in the routing table, but the route would not be added to the forwarding table, so it would not be actively used. A BFD profile configures the firewall interface to use bidirectional forwarding detection, or BFD.
BFD is a vendor independent mechanism used between two interfaces to detect a failed route. Both the firewall and the peer at the opposite end of the static route must support BFD sessions. BFD can be configured on all firewall models except for the PA200 and PA500. You can configure multiple static default routes. Each default route is assigned a different metric, with the lowest metric used to determine the route that is actively used. Starting with PAN OS 8.0, a new feature named Static Route Path Monitoring is used by the firewall to determine whether a static route is functioning. If path monitoring determines that a route is no longer working, the firewall switches to the static default route with the higher metric. Prior to PAN OS 8.0, only the failure of a physical firewall interface would cause a failover between two static routes. Path monitoring continues to monitor all paths even after a failure. If path monitoring detects that the static default route with the lower metric is available again, path monitoring will cause the firewall to switch back to that route path. Starting with PAN OS 8.0, you can configure the firewall with path monitoring so that the firewall removes static route table entries when a path failure occurs upstream from the firewall. To inform the firewall when a static route is down, use path monitoring to detect when the path to one or more monitored destinations is no longer reachable by ICMP pings. The firewall can then reroute traffic using an alternative route. With firewall path monitoring, the firewall sends ICMP ping messages, or heartbeat messages, to one or more monitored destinations that you determine are robust and reflect the availability of the static route. If pings to any or all of the monitored destinations become unreachable, the firewall considers the static route down and removes it from the routing information base. The firewall selects an alternative static route to the same destination, based on the route with the lowest metric, from the RIB and places it in the FIB. The firewall continues to monitor the failed route. When the monitored destination becomes reachable and, based on the any or all failure condition, the path monitor returns to the up state and the preemptive hold timer begins. If the path monitor remains in the up state for the duration of the hold timer, then the firewall considers the static route stable and reinstates it into the RIB. The firewall then compares metrics of routes to the same destination to decide which route goes in the FIB. To configure path monitoring, click the Path Monitoring checkbox and select a Failure condition. The any condition means that a route path will be removed if at least one of the monitored paths fail. The all condition means that a route path will be removed only if all monitored paths fail. Then click a descriptive name for the path monitoring configuration and click the enable checkbox. If the interface associated with the static route has multiple IP addresses, you can select one for the source IP address. By default, the first IP address assigned to the interface is chosen. Then choose the destination IP address of a stable device that is reached through the default route. You can also adjust the default values for the ping interval and number of missed pings that will result in a route path failure. Click the More Runtime Stats link to display detailed information about a virtual router's current routing state and configuration. The Routing tab contains three tabs, the Route Table tab, the Forwarding Table tab, and the Static Route Monitoring tab. The Route Table tab displays the RIB that contains all currently known routes. The Forwarding Table tab displays the FIB that is derived from the RIB and contains the firewall interfaces and IP addresses currently used to forward all network traffic. The Static Router Monitoring tab displays the status of the monitor paths used to detail static route failures.
VLAN interfaces. Networks attached to Layer 2 interfaces and a VLAN object can be attached to a virtual router by configuring a VLAN interface. You assign a VLAN interface an IPv4 or IPv6 address and attach it to a virtual router, which provides a routable path from the firewall's Layer 2 interfaces to the firewall's Layer 3 interfaces. To configure a VLAN interface, browse to Network, Interfaces, VLAN, and click Add. All VLAN interfaces have the same read-only base name, VLAN. If you configure multiple VLAN interfaces, each interface will be identified by a unique ID number appended to the base name. In the example, the VLAN interface is uniquely identified by the name VLAN.1. The VLAN interface ID number is not a VLAN tag number. You assign each VLAN interface to a single VLAN object, a single virtual router, and a single security zone. Loopback Interfaces a loopback interface is a logical interface that can be reached through a physical interface or sub-interface. Each loopback interface is assigned an IP address and behaves as a host interface. Just as a host with an IP address can provide services to clients, a loopback interface can provide firewall services to clients. Firewall services provided through a loopback interface include HTTPS access to the web UI, access to Global Protect Portal or Gateway services, or access to an IPsec VPN tunnel. To configure a loopback interface, browse to Network, Interfaces, Loopback, and click Add. Configure a loopback interface as you would a Layer 3 interface with one exception. The IP address assigned to a loopback interface must have no net mask or a slash 32 net mask. Policy-based forwarding. Policy-based forwarding, or PBF, rules allow traffic to take an alternative path from the next hop specified in the route table and are typically used to specify an egress interface for security or performance reasons. Assume that your company has two links between the corporate office and the branch office, a less expensive internet link and a more expensive leased line. The leased line is a high bandwidth, low latency link. For enhanced security, you can use PBF to send applications that do not use encrypted traffic, such as FTP traffic, over the private leased line, while the other traffic is sent over the Internet link. Or for performance, you can choose to route business-critical applications over the leased line while sending all other traffic, such as web browsing, over the less expensive and slower Internet link. PBF does not apply to traffic that originates from the firewall itself, for example, IPsec VPN, Global Protect, or virtual router traffic. The firewall normally uses the destination IP address in a packet, along with the virtual router's forwarding table, to determine the outgoing interface. PBF rules enable you to specify match criteria such as the source zone or interface, source user, source or destination IP address, application, or destination port to match traffic and specify an outgoing interface. PBF includes a path monitoring feature that enables the firewall to verify connectivity to an external IP address. This PBF feature enables the firewall to direct traffic through an alternate egress interface, 
if the interface specified by the matching PBF rule has lost network connectivity. The firewall uses ICMP pings as heartbeats to verify that the specified IP address is reachable. You configure a monitoring profile that specifies the threshold number of heartbeats that determine whether the external IP address is reachable. When the monitored IP address is unreachable, you can either disable the PBF rule or specify a failover or wait recover action. Disable the PBF rule to enable the virtual router to take over the routing decisions. When the failover or wait recover action is taken, the monitoring profile continues to monitor whether the target IP address is reachable. When it becomes reachable again, the firewall reverts to using the original PBF egress interface. To create a PBF rule, browse to Policies, Policy-based forwarding, and click Add. On the General tab, enter a descriptive name. The name itself must be unique on the firewall. Click the Source tab to add, view, or modify the source zone, source address, or source user match criteria for the rule. Click the Destination, Application, Service tab to add, view, or modify the destination address, application, or service match criteria for the rule. The service specifies the Layer 4 protocol port numbers that the rule can match. Palo Alto Networks recommends that you not add specific applications because multiple network packets might be required before the firewall can identify the application. If not enough packets have been received, it means that the rule initially might not match the most correct application. For example, the firewall uses the first packets to initially identify YouTube traffic as the web browsing application. However, after the firewall receives more packets, it can more specifically identify the application as Flash, RTSP, or YouTube. Identifying an application from only the initial packets means that a PBF rule that specifies the application YouTube might not be forwarded correctly. However, after the firewall has fully identified an application, it will cache the destination IP, port, and protocol information and use the cached information to immediately identify the application for any subsequent connections to that same destination. Use the Forwarding tab to specify packet forwarding options.